11 Facts About John Carpenter's The Thing That Are As Fascinating As The Film Itself John Carpenter was just 34 when he directed this classic sci-fi horror film. Over a period of time, it's been hailed by many as the best film of the genre, with credit going to John Carpenter's directorial expertise, Rob Botton's wonderfully scary creature effects, and class acting by the likes of Kurt Russell. I guess you do. The Thing didn't enjoy this reputation at first. Critics and audiences failed to appreciate the dark theme and grim elements of claustrophobia, mistrust, and paranoia. They even had major issues with the film's monster, which many thought was too visceral and forced. Gotta be fucking kidding. However, as time went and people became more accustomed to sci-fi, they saw the film's originality and creativity. Prominent filmmakers like Quentin Tarantino, Neil Blomkamp, and Guillermo del Toro have often regarded John Carpenter's The Thing as a source of inspiration. The movie is an adaptation of John W. Campbell's novella, Who Goes There? In 1951, Campbell's work was adapted in a black-and-white sci-fi film named The Thing from Another World, but that one was merely a loose translation. <laughs> When John Carpenter was chosen to make a remake, he decided to stick to the source material and consequently did justice to Campbell's book. In this video, we will take you on an exciting behind-the-scenes journey of this great film and tell you facts that are as fascinating as the film itself. So put on your winter jackets, dim the lights, and get ready to be introduced to John Carpenter's The Thing. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Number 1. Tobey Hooper's Moby Dick from Antarctica vs. John Carpenter's Shapeshifter The initial thought of making the thing began in the 70s when David Foster and Lawrence Terman wished to adapt John W. Campbell's novella Who Goes There? Soon, Universal bought the rights, but it would take another few years before production could start. John Carpenter was the first choice of co-producer Stuart Cohen, but back in 1976, Carpenter was nothing more than an independent director with no experience with big-budget monster films. Naturally, Universal didn't want Carpenter to have the reins, with the company instead preferring Tobey Hooper, who had just directed the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Hooper failed to impress the producers because his idea of the film was totally different from what was desired. In Stuart Cohen's own words, Hooper wanted to make the film more like Moby Dick of Antarctica, with an Ahab-like character who would battle against a huge beast. The major issues with Hooper's outlook of the thing was that the monster wouldn't shapeshift, and the prime themes of paranoia and suspicion were missing. Now I'll show you what I already know. By now, it was 1979, John Carpenter had given audiences the iconic blockbuster Halloween in 1978, and Ridley Scott's 1979 Alien was a massive success. These events renewed the talk about the thing in Universal, and this time, they decided to go with Mr. Carpenter. John Carpenter was apprehensive about taking the job, because he wasn't sure if he'd be able to top Howard Hawks' 1951 film, The Thing from Another World. Carpenter was such a fan of Hawks that in his film Halloween, two of the characters, Tommy and Laurie, watched The Thing from Another World. A few years later, he was actually directing the thing. That's some coincidence. Number 2. The cast almost died on their way to filming. The executives wished that most of the filming took place on sets, but Carpenter was a man of perfection. He insisted that real locations were necessary, and he had this upper hand because of the massive success of his previous film, Halloween. The executives wanted to save money, but ultimately gave in to Carpenter. A location along the Canadian coast was selected and the cast and crew were to travel there for the shooting. They flew to Vancouver from Los Angeles, but bad weather didn't allow further air travel. The last leg of the journey was to be on a bus. The six-hour ride turned out to be one of the scariest moments for all of them when the bus slid on the snowy road towards the unprotected side of the road. Had the bus fallen down, they'd have crashed in a 500-foot deep embankment. Thankfully, the driver regained control of the bus and everyone was safe. However, most of the interior scenes were shot in a refrigerated soundstage. Number 3. Rob Botton and His Deadly Dedication When Botton joined Carpenter's force, he was just 22, but he and Carpenter had already worked before in the 1980 film The Fog. It was Botton's idea to make the monster a constantly evolving beast, whereas Carpenter wanted the thing to be a single creature. At the peak of the designing, Botton was leading a crew of 35 people. This was something he hadn't done before, but then he hadn't worked on a big-budget film either. Botton heavily influenced the thing's design. 
For instance, it was his idea to give the monster various shape-shifting abilities, like the transformation of chests into giant mouths with razor-sharp teeth or the growth of spider legs from a person's head. He explained that the thing got these abilities as a result of thousands of years of evolution and traveling to different parts of the galaxy. Carpenter ultimately accepted Botten's ideas because they did not depict the creature as a guy in a suit. Once the designs were finalized, Botten started the task of bringing them to life. He was furiously dedicated to his craft and spent almost a year working rigorously. He would sleep on the sets or in locker rooms, and it's not difficult to understand that a 22-year-old can fail to take care of himself. In the final few days, he had to be hospitalized for exhaustion, bleeding ulcers, and double pneumonia. It was now that Botten sought the help of legendary creature designer Stan Winston. It was Winston who created the dog thing, but didn't accept credit for his work and maintained that Botten was the one who deserved it. Ultimately, Stan Winston was thanked in the credits for his immense and timely assistance. <laughs> Number 4. The Dog Thing and the Double Amputee As we mentioned, it was the last leg of production when Stan Winston obliged to help Botten and Carpenter with the Dog Thing. Winston decided to go with a hand puppet instead of a more sophisticated mechanical creature, with such less time in hand. Makeup artist Lance Anderson was to play the Dog Thing, so a cast of his head and legs were made of clay. The eyes were radio-controlled while the numerous tentacles were cable-controlled from underneath the dog kennel. If you recall, the dog thing was being shot at. Anderson had to wear a helmet to protect himself from the explosive squibs that stimulated gunfire. The scene turned out to be one of the greatest in the film. Another peculiar and interesting part was the chest chomp scene in which Norris turns out to be the thing. Dr. Copper attempts to revive Norris using a defibrillator on his chest. In doing so, Norris's chest opens and takes the form of a huge mouth with sharp teeth that chomp Dr. Copper's hands. Botten was the mind behind this imaginative scene. He called in a double amputee body double and fixed two fake arms on his shoulders, and these were made out of wax, rubber, and jello. The arms were placed inside the mechanical mouth, and as the teeth sunk into the arms, the body double moved away. This gave the idea that the arms of Dr. Copper were chopped off. Number 5. The Thing About Dynamites, Kurt Russell, and John Carpenter It's an established fact that John Carpenter likes things when they are real. What is it? In the Palmer thing scene, Kurt Russell's character throws a stick of dynamite on Palmer. You'd be surprised to know that the dynamite was real. The dynamite explodes and we see McReady being blown back. Well, Kurt Russell knew the stick of dynamite was real, but he failed to comprehend its power. He failed to move out of the blast radius and was actually blown back due to the explosion. Fortunately, he was not hurt at all. The entire event was recorded on camera, and Carpenter found it very convincing, so he chose to keep it in the film. Apart from the bus accident, this was another near-fatal accident related to the thing. Carpenter seems to be a master of improvisation and shifting. In the initial few minutes of the film, we are taken to a burned-down Norwegian base. Strangely, this was the last sequence to be shot. Is that a man in there or something? Whatever it is, they burn it up in a hurry. Carpenter and his crew didn't wish to spend more money for an entirely new Norwegian base. So, after the American base was actually blown up and destroyed at the film's end, what was left of the base was used to shoot the initial sequence. <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> Elliot. What? Number 6. The Extraterrestrial Stole the Thing's Thunder when Carpenter took the reign of the film, he was pretty scared of how the audience would react to the final film, but as filming went on, he became more and more confident. As a movie, the thing lacked humor and comedy, but it filled those gaps with other powerful ingredients like groundbreaking paranoia, beautifully crafted special effects, and a sense of eternal loneliness and helplessness. However, the film was released just two weeks after Steven Spielberg's 1982 E.T. The Extraterrestrial was released. While Spielberg's classic gave a kind alien, Carpenter offered a ferocious one that was killing people and wanted to take over Earth. Um. E.T. had a happy ending, while the things left people scratching their heads. Naturally, these contrasts got reflected in the way audiences perceived the two films. Beat shit in two weeks! I doubt if anybody's talked to anybody on this entire continent, and you want me to reach somebody! Carpenters fell flat on its face, at least in the initial days after the release. The kid-friendly E.T. appealed more to the parents as well. However, as time passed, the thing earned a little short of $20 million. You were the only one that could have got to that blood. We'll do you last. <laughs> Number 7. The Cold Reaction of Critics It wasn't just general audiences. The thing was given an ice-cold reaction by critics and sci-fi fans, too. The special effects were lauded for being technically brilliant, but they were accused of being too aggressive and visually loud. Almost none of these reviewers could understand the entire use of paranoia and distrust, when in fact, 
These were some of the greatest contributors that made the film a classic in times to come. While a few called it a laughable ripoff of Alien, others felt that the violence was forced and unnecessary. We are of the opinion that John Carpenter's The Thing was an untimely masterpiece, and critics had never seen anything so brilliant, and failed to comprehend that brilliance. Years later, if we are making a video dedicated to this sci-fi horror classic, it is solely because it deserves respect. Number 8. The characters were killed in more ways than one. Several scenes were edited out from the script for multiple reasons. They would sometimes have too much dialogue, which would stall the pace and reduce the element of suspense. At other times, they'd be cut from the script because of being too expensive. Flare cracking up or what? Senator McCready, there is still cellular activity in these burned remains. They're not dead yet. Also, jump scare scenes from Carpenter's Halloween had been replicated in other horror films, and he wanted to keep a safe distance from such cliches, despite the fact that they were his own invention. Furthermore, several other moments that weren't a part of the script were added to the film. And sounded and acted just like Benny's. I don't know what you're saying. That was one of those things out there, trying to imitate him, Gary. This included McReady's monologue. The point we are trying to make is that The Thing was a very well thought out film, something which was reflected in multiple alternate deaths for the characters. But McReady, I've been thinking, if a small particle of this thing is enough to take over an entire organism. Fuchs's charred remains are found and hint that he died off screen. But in an alternate scene, his body was impaled on a wall with a shovel. Nulls simply disappears in the film, but in the script, he was to appear as a huge mass filled with tentacles, something on the lines of the dog thing. Bennings' death probably saw the most number of changes. Bennings was scripted to be pulled under the ice by the alien, and then he was to appear at different parts of the film with successfully progressed stages of assimilation. However, he was simply filmed as being killed by an unknown person. This didn't throw light on how assimilation kills the victim. So, Bennings was fitted with rubber tentacles and monster gloves, and then they covered him with KY jelly and orange dye. By doing this, Carpenter could show the effects of partial assimilation. Where are we going? Up to my shack. What the hell for? Because when I left yesterday, I turned the lights off. Number 9. John Carpenter's The Thing is more than a remake. In 1951, Christian Nyby and Howard Hawks released The Thing from Another World, which was an adaptation of the 1938 novella Who Goes There by John W. Campbell. John Carpenter's The Thing and Nyby's film have the same source material, but they are two very different films. Nyby's film takes the main content from the novella about a group of scientists finding an alien life form in an icy setting, but Nyby turned it into a monster film with James Arnis as a huge monster from outer space. Carpenter didn't want to compete with the Nyby Hawks film because he respected it too much. So, Carpenter stuck to the novella's original story and focused on the compelling idea that the alien can shapeshift into any living creature around it. John read the novella a few times and drew parallels between it and Agatha Christie's 1939 mystery novel, and then there were none. Christie's classic was also made into a 2015 television series and dealt with a group of ten eccentric strangers invited into a mansion. Upon arrival, they were treated with darkness, and soon, bodies started piling up. The surviving guests realize that there is a killer among them. Naturally, Carpenter made a gruelingly grim film by blending both pieces of literature. To appreciate the thing, it is crucial to grasp and embrace that darkness, something that the critics back in 1982 failed to do. Mac wants the flamethrower. Mac wants the what? That's what he said, now move! Damn it. Number 10, post-production pressure and publicity stunts. Producer David Foster attended the screening of E.T. because the film would be preceded by a trailer of The Thing and he wanted to see the audience's reaction. He was disheartened by the cold response which resembled the cold setting of the film. Yeah, fuck you too! So, as a last attempt at reviving the public interest, many changes were made around the film's publicity. They changed the initial black and white poster to a colored one. Stephen Frankfurt had written the tagline of Alien, which was, in space, no one can hear you scream. He also wrote the tagline for Carpenter's The Thing, and initially it was, Man is the warmest place to hide. But the executives wanted to exhaust and capitalize on the popularity of Ridley Scott's Alien. So, they changed the tagline to, The Ultimate in Alien Terror. The famous horror magazine Fangoria held a drawing contest in 1981 and asked people to draw what The Thing would look like. The winners would earn a trip to Universal Studios. John attempted to get the title of the film changed from The Thing to Who Goes There, but it was too late. Interestingly, the winning submission of the Fangoria contest was uploaded on Instagram in 2018. It doesn't resemble anything like what was shown in the film, but we cannot deny that this was a terrifying alien. It looks as if Medusa mated with a xenomorph. We do. Why don't we just... wait here for a little while. Number 11. The alternate ending that never came to life. 
Without a doubt, the thing's ending is bleak and ambiguous. This raised a few eyebrows, and the most concerned was editor Todd Ramsey. He requested John Carpenter to shoot an alternative ending and possibly a less bleak and happy one. John agreed, and he shot a scene that showed McReady was ultimately rescued and was taken to a room where he was given a blood test to test if he was infected. McReady passes the test and the film ends there. However, this scene never saw the light of day, and it was probably for good. We think that the whole point of the film was to show that the all-male crew had no idea what was happening, who was their friend, and who was their enemy. And, Carpenter wanted to make his audience feel exactly what the characters were feeling. A sense of morbid confusion, suspicion, and ambiguity. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone. It's one of the best screenplays I've ever read. And uh, it's unique in a real special sort of way. And I just love it.